Hello and welcome back to Principles of Macroeconomics. I am your host, Dr. B. Today we're going to be talking about supply and demand, which is the foundation of everything in economics. Uh, before we get started, I do want to quickly call your attention to the classroom and tell you where we are, what's going on. Uh, fall 2022 semester, if you scroll on down, we are in module one. We made it all the way to week three so far. So go ahead and click week three. And then for those of you who want to follow along uh, with the presentation, week three, and then the PowerPoint presentation can be found in there. Uh, for this Sunday night, you have a discussion board. I know, discussion board. Oh, the Dr. B, the discussion board, you're killing me with them things. You're making me respond to my classmates. I know I'm so sorry. But it is a great way for you all to interact with each other. I made sure that this discussion board is exciting because it's talking about current pandemic times, talking about shifts in supply and demand. I'm looking for you to think about what's happening in today's environment. We know that there's a computer chip shortage for automobiles and electronics. We also know that there are other shortages that you see at the grocery store and, uh, you know, whatever. We're seeing a lot of crazy things in the market today due to supply and demand changes as a result of the pandemic. So that's what that discussion is all about. Please make sure that you type full paragraphs. Please, full paragraphs. You guys are killing me. Full paragraphs, okay? A full paragraph, by the way, that's not one sentence. That's not two. That's not three. That's like four, five, six, yeah? Those are full sentences, full paragraphs, yeah? About four to six sentences per paragraph, yeah? Uh, and please respond to two of your classmates, two of your classmates with full paragraph responses. Do not type one sentence that will not count, okay? Um, you know, full paragraph responses to two of your classmates in the discussion board. We all clear on this requirement? Affirmative. Yes, yes, yes. All good. Okay. Thank you so much. I just want to make sure you're all clear on the expectations for the discussion boards because I want you to get those full points now, okay? Because I will dock points if it's not as expected, full paragraphs, yeah? Two responses, yeah. Make sure it's on time, Sunday night, yeah? Okay. I'll get off my high horse, I apologize. But it's a good discussion because it's about current times. Okay, supply and demand, here we go. Make it exciting, I promise you. This is an exciting topic, especially because it's very relatable. Ask questions, please ask questions along the way. Okay, supply and demand. The best way for you to understand supply and demand is real simple. You have a need for a product, okay? It could be clothing, yeah, clothing. Everyone needs clothing. There is a demand for clothing. Yeah, we all need it. It's a demand. A demand is where you need something. That's a demand. Okay? Society needs things. We need housing. We need clothing. We need energy. We need water. Right? The four, the four basic walls, as they say. Shelter, clothing, fuel to get to work. Oh, and food, yeah, the four basic walls. Everyone in society needs these four basic things to survive. These four basic things are demanded by society as a whole. We need them to survive. Demand is the need for things, okay? It could be a need for housing, a need for food, a need for clothing, uh, a need for fuel. So, four basic things. We, the people, demand these things. We need them. Okay? So that's demand. On the other side is supply. The supply is the availability of what we need. Availability of housing. Availability of fuel. Availability of clothing. Availability of water, okay? the basic things, 
The demand is what we need. The supply is the availability of those things that we need. That's the basics of it. That's supply and demand. We have supply and demand for everything. Okay? There's, and that's what dictate, dictates prices. People think that people just make prices up. No! It's not made up. It's based off of supply and demand. You know, that's how things are priced. So these are the things I need you to think about. Get in that mindset, okay? So these are the basic questions. First, before we jump into like the details of supply and demand, we need to understand what the market is. Okay, a market, very simply the definition, very broad definition, a group of buyers and sellers of a particular good or a service. There's a market for gasoline. There's a market for clothing. There's a market for housing. There's a market for electronics. There's a market for cars. There's a market for, I could keep going on like this, yeah. But there's a group of buyers, the individuals that need the stuff, the demand side, the buyers. And there's a group of sellers, the people supplying the goods that are needed, okay, that are demanded. The buyers are the people demanding. The sellers are the people supplying okay, of a particular good or service. That is what a market is. Buyers are the demand side. Sellers are the supply side. Okay. And that's how markets are created. There's a need for a good or service. And that need is being met by supply of the good or the service. That's a market. Marketplaces are typically competitive. What I mean by that, by competition, is that there are a lot of buyers and sellers, and they're selling the same stuff, but they're very competitive. They compete on price. Okay? So here's how I want to think about this. You're walking down Canal Street in New York City. Okay, you're walking down Canal Street in New York City in Chinatown. And there's a lot of uh, little shops, yeah? And these little shops, they're selling uh, all the New York City junk. You know, the, the tourist stuff, the souvenirs, okay? So you walk down Canal Street, every store has the same stuff, okay? The same stuff. The difference might be a few cents. Okay, but they're also on the same exact thing. Another way to think about this is the gas stations. Right, some of you live in neighborhoods, tons of gas stations everywhere. You you got one, you got four on the same street corner, yeah? Okay, and you're driving down and you see, oh, what's the difference? One cent, two cents, three cents. Sometimes ridiculous, like ten cents, but but you know what I'm saying. They're all selling the same exact thing. And there's a lot of them, just at different prices. Yeah. That's what makes it competitive. That's what makes it competitive. In a perfectly competitive market, the goods are the exact same. Okay, the goods are the exact same. The buyers and sellers are so numerous that no one can affect the market price. We call these price takers. Uh, examples of this, yeah, definitely gas stations. You know, not one buyer or seller can dictate the price. It's just not possible. Uh, you know, that's a perfectly competitive market. Now, demand. We talked about the markets. Okay, now let's talk about the demand side of things. Demand is uh, what the people need. Okay, and what they're willing to buy. The quantity is the amount that we need or are willing to buy at a price. Okay, we need to be able to purchase it. 
It needs to be within reach. That's what dictates the quantity demanded. Example. Uh, my car requires, to fill it, requires 17 gallons of gasoline. Okay? At a price of three dollars uh, we'll say four dollars okay at a price of four dollars a gallon i can only afford 15 gallons okay what we just did there is we figured out the quantity demand okay the car fills up on 17. i can only afford 14 gallons so therefore i'm willing and able to buy 14 gallons of gasoline at $4 a gallon. That's how we find quantity demanded. Okay, that's one example. Another example. Uh, hmm. A new pair of jeans, blue jeans, yeah? A uh, new pair of blue jeans. Uh, I have four pairs of blue jeans. I need to buy one pair of blue jeans okay so that will bring me to five i am willing and able to purchase a pair of blue jeans for forty dollars okay so that dictates the quantity demand yeah it's the amount that we're willing to buy at a particular time and at a particular price that's quantity demanded there's a couple of things that influence demand, yeah? When prices decrease, usually the demand will increase. When prices go up, demand typically comes down. When prices go down, demand typically goes up. Think of... Um, oranges okay the price of oranges this is a good one so uh we had a uh drought this this year uh 2022 in california where a lot of our oranges come from yeah and uh because of the drought in california uh we produced less oranges this year the price of oranges at the grocery store rose because there's less of them. Yeah, less oranges, higher price. Less oranges, higher price. We went from 25 cents per orange to 50 cents per orange. Okay? So the prices of oranges went up. When the prices of oranges go up, I'm going to buy less of them. I will probably buy apples instead. They are cheaper. And I still get my nutrients. Price goes up, I'm going to want less. Price goes down, I'm going to want more. These are the laws of demand. Okay? Demand is dictated by price. Price goes up, I want less. Price goes down, I want more. That's the basics of the law of demand. Okay, just like now, being this inflation, like we in this inflation right now. Yes, ma'am. And just you know that demand is very high for gas, food. Yes, ma'am. Like you know, normal household products. That's you right. Know, the prices are crazy. I just left the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, uh, Miss Anthony, you're absolutely right. And, uh, it, you know, it's it's interesting because here in 2022, we're experiencing, as you know, a very high rate of inflation. Inflation is when there's too much money supply uh, on the open market. We talked about this maybe two weeks ago. And uh, when there's too much money supply, the price of everything goes up. Yeah, that's the basic principles of inflation. When everything goes up, the demand typically stays the same. Sometimes it goes down, sometimes it goes down because we can't afford as much, yeah? Because our wages did not increase with the inflation, yeah? 
and that's true in most cases. They say they, you know, oh, don't get me started on the government side of things. But my point is, inflation went up, wages stayed relatively the same. Okay, which, what, and the purpose of that is to slow demand down. Okay, I'm going to buy less lattes at Starbucks because the price went up. Okay, that's just that's just simple law of demand. Price went up at Starbucks. I'm making the same amount of money. I buy less lattes. Very simple. I, uh, and that's that's the concept of it. So you're right, uh, Miss Anthony. Uh, there is a, a strong play when it comes to um, inflation, but I will also say that it does have an effect on demand. It doesn't take hold right away. It usually takes some time, about a year or two. Good point, though. So this slide we're showing you here uh, is uh, what we call the demand schedule, okay? The demand schedule. We can see the lowest price, zero, okay? Everyone's going to want a latte. I want 16 of them at zero. Yeah, absolutely. Give me as many as you can. That's what I would say, okay? Pretend I'm Sam, and I'm at Starbucks, and I want lattes, or I love lattes. Okay, I'm at Starbucks. I want lattes. If it's zero dollars, I'll give me 16 of them. Yeah. If a latte is one dollar, I'll get 14 of them. Yeah, one dollar. Yeah. Two dollars. Uh, give me 12. Three dollars. Give me 10. Four dollars. Eh. What else? Getting a little steep there. I'll only take eight. Five dollars. Give me six. Six dollars. Give me four. Seven dollars. Give me two. Nine dollars. I don't know if I'm going to get any. <laughs> but you see the relationship, yes? As the price goes up, the demand goes down. Price goes up, demand goes down. That's the conceptual framework. Okay? We can graph this out. Price goes up, demand comes down. The one number one thing you need to know the demand curve, the demand curve, which is what I'm showing you right here. This is called the demand curve. It is always, and I mean always, downward sloping and to the right. The demand curve is always downward sloping and to the right. And we can see lower price. I want a ton of them. Higher price. I don't want very many. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so the relationship is and always, almost always, you'll see the money, the, the dollar amount, on the y-axis. And you'll typically always see the quantity on the x-axis. Okay? So quantities on the bottom, prices on the left. Uh, and, and it's typically always this way. This is the demand curve. I want less when the price is high. I want more when the price is low. That's why it's always downward sloping into the right. This is the demand curve. I can summation, summarize, that all of all individual demands of a good or a service. What I mean by that is I can group everyone's demand together. That's why I can always figure out what the oil price is going to be tomorrow. It's based off of the demand today. Yeah. So everyone has demand for oil, which is gasoline, you know, eventually gasoline when it, after it's processed. And based off of that demand, I can group everyone's demand together because everyone needs it. Yeah. Same with housing, same with clothing. I can always group the individual demands together for a good or a service. That's what we call market demand. It's put, basically, it just puts it from an individual perspective into a large scale perspective. Okay. I took a small piece of the, of the picture of the puzzle, and I, now I can see the whole puzzle. Okay. I looked at the individual, and now I'm looking at the whole market. That's what market demand is. It's looking at the whole market. The market demand curve is the summary of the individual demand curves on the horizontal line. And I'll show you what this looks like. 
It's basically a larger version of supply and demand. To find the total quantity demanded, we add the individual quantities. Makes sense. That's how you get a group. Yeah, you add the individuals up to get a group. Let's say a whole lot of people wanted lattes. Okay. But for right now, I'm going to look at two individuals to make it easy. I got Sam and I got Dean. They're at Starbucks. They love Starbucks. They're addicted to it. And they both have individual demands for lattes. They both like lattes. Sam likes his lattes a little bit more than Dean does. Okay. Uh, Sam Sam might be a diabetic. I'm not sure. He probably is if he's drinking 16 lattes. But Dan, Dean, on the other hand, eh, he's just hyped up on caffeine. Okay, so let's look at these two individuals side by side. Sam takes 16, which is insane, lattes at zero dollars. Dean will only take eight. Dean ain't greedy. Okay, well, you see... Uh, at a dollar, Sam's at 14, Dean's at 7, $2, Sam's at 12, Dean's at 6. It's really about half, looks like half. So Dean's demand is half of Sam's. Yeah? Sam really likes lattes. Dean likes them, but he, he ain't loving them. So that's what this information shows us. So we got two individuals that really like lattes. I can figure out the market demand for these two individuals. All I do to figure out what market demand is, is I add all the individuals up. That's what equals the market. This is the market for lattes. Okay. I got Sam, I got Dean. They both like lattes. I add them both up to equal the total market demand for lattes. And I do that for each amount. So at zero, together, Sam and Dean want 24. At three dollars, well, Sam and Dean together, they want 15. So on and so on, yes? All, again, all market demand is, so we're adding up the individuals within the market. This is the market for lattes at Starbucks. I can graph the market demand for lattes using the demand curve. Again, I'm just plotting it out on the graph. Okay. Again, at zero, at zero, everyone wants them. Yeah. 24. At six dollars, only six. Downward sloping into the right, the demand curve. This is the market demand for lattes at Starbucks for both CM and D. This number would be a lot higher if I had more people, but I only got two. The demand curve can be shifted. It shifts, of course it shifts. The demand curve can be shifted to the left or can be shifted to the right. These market shifts in demand, what causes the market shift in demand? It's usually affected by another factor. Other things, okay, will cause shifts in the man. Uh, it could be things other than price. It could be things like a pandemic, okay, that shifted my demand for certain things. My demand went way up for toilet paper. I don't know why. It just did. It shifted to the right, okay? Uh, it, um, or it might shift to the left. I need less of it now. But the demand curve itself can shift, and it's it's based off of other factors other than just the price. What causes demand shift? The number of buyers in the marketplace will cause the demand to shift. If there's uh, if there's more demand then the demand curve will shift to the right. We got more people, okay? We got more people, uh, let's say we got more people moving to DC, okay? Think about that for a second. 
Think about the housing market. Let's do the housing market, okay? We got more people wanting to move to D.C. That's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. What does it do to the demand for housing? It goes way up, right? Yeah, it skyrockets. Now everyone wants a house because there's more people wanting to move to D.C., okay? If the demand is higher, they need more houses. And if they need more houses, what does that do? The existing home prices goes way up. Okay. And we see that today, 2022. That's very common, very common place. So increases in quantity demand at each price will cause the demand curve to shift to the right. If there's a decrease in the number of buyers, there's less people moving to D.C. There's more people moving out of D.C. than in. Okay. When that happens, obviously the prices of houses will fall. Okay. And that will cause a shift in the man curve to the left. Okay. Less quantity needed. Less quantity needed. Less prices needed. Shift to the left. These are things that affect the demand curve that will shift them to the left or the right. So what about our latte example? You know, I had Sam and Dean, but what if I added Frank or someone, okay? Now I got three people who really like their lattes. It's going to cause a shift in the demand curve to the right. You know, I added a third person on the, my latte train. So when that happens, I added another person, I got a shift to the man curve to accommodate that additional person. So I shifted to the right, because now I have more buyers. But the opposite, of course, would happen if I had less buyers. Like, let's say Sam left. Now it's just Dean. Now, of course, it's going to go to the left. Uh, okay, another thing that affects demand curve, income. Income goes up and down. We know this. Okay? Income goes up when there's higher inflation, we think. It's supposed to. It normally doesn't. Sometimes it does. Income changes. Okay? Normal income is a good thing. You know, having things consistent. If there's an increase in the income... It'll lead to an increase in the demand. If I have higher income, I could afford more gallons of gasoline. If I had more income, I could afford more oranges. If I had more income, I could afford more lattes. Okay. Higher income, it's going to shift the demand curve to the right. But if income decreases... You know, it's not doing so well. People aren't making as much money at their jobs. It'll cause a shift in the demand curve to the left. We see the correlation. Substitutes will also cause shifts in the demand curve. A substitute is simply a replacement of one good for another. Okay? Substitute. Substitute. Substitute teacher. No, I'm kidding. I'm not a substitute. Uh, maybe I am. I don't know. Okay, anyway. Uh, two goods or substitutes if an increase in the prices of one leads to an increase in demand for the other. If the prices of oranges go up from 25 cents to 50 cents a piece, it will cause me to buy more apples. If the price of oranges goes up from 25 cents to 50 cents a piece, it will cause me to buy more apples. Apples is a substitute for oranges. Okay. Another example is pizza. If the price of pizza goes up, it will cause a higher demand for hamburgers. It'll cause a shift in the demand for hamburgers to the right. 
same is true of my apples and uh, oranges uh, analogy. If the price of oranges goes up from 25 cents to 50 cents per orange, it'll cause the demand for apples to increase, which will cause the demand curve for apples to shift to the right. Hey, you, this, this could go on and on, Coke, Pepsi, laptops, tablets, whatever, music CDs over music downloads, et cetera, et cetera. Music CDs, I don't even know if they still exist, but if they do, uh, you know, I can't imagine the demand being too high. So that's substitutes. What about complements? Goods can be complementary, okay? Uh, think of like um, complementary goods. Uh, let's say ketchup and relish or ketchup and uh, mustard. These are complementary items. They complement each other, okay? They play off each other in taste, yeah? If there's an increase in the price of one, it leads to a decrease in demand for the other. Okay, here's an example, another example, other than my fancy one for ketchup and mustard. What about computers and software? They go hand in hand, don't they? You got a computer, you probably have software, right? We all, right now we're watching a PowerPoint presentation through Microsoft PowerPoint, that software. Came with the computer, it's complimentary. Complements the computer, okay? If the price of computers go up, people are gonna buy less computers. But if they buy less computers, that also means they're gonna buy less software, which means there'll be a shift in the demand curve for software to the left. Makes sense, right? Uh, I can keep going on like this. College tuition goes up. Oh man, doesn't that suck? College tuition goes up. That means that less people will go to college. It's true. And because less people are going to college, that means that the textbooks, the demand for textbooks will also decrease which will cause a shift in the demand curve for textbooks to the left. All this is making sense so far to you all, right? I'm doing okay? Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Ms. Anthony. Other things that affect shifts in the demand curve is taste. Sometimes our tastes change. I used to really like ice cream. I used to be a huge fan of ice cream. I used to be a big sweet tooth, you know, but nowadays, not so much. I just, it, eh, you know, it just kind of went out. I just, eh, I'm no longer interested in ice cream. Now I'm interested in candy bars. Okay. So my, my, my taste, they changed. And that happens. You know, uh, back in the... Um, Back in the early 90s, you know, the kids used to be really interested in um, the really wide pant bottoms. You know, just like back in the set, you know, back in the 70s, 60s, the bottom of the pant legs, huge, right? They, you know, they called them bell bottoms back then. And uh, that came back for a little bit in the 90s. And uh, it's gone now, <laughs> which is probably a good thing. And, uh, you know, because nobody's tripping over their own clothing. But the shift in the demand curve, it, yeah, it shifted because no one's wearing the bell bottoms no more. <laughs> it's, that fad went away. That was just a trend for a little bit. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Example, the Atkins diet. Oh, actually, that kind of came back, didn't it? A little bit. It was real popular back in the 90s. It caused an increase in the demand for eggs, yeah, because that was a big part of the Atkins diet. So it shifted the demand curve for eggs to the right. Yeah, a lot of people needed more eggs for their for their diet. But that's just an example of changes in, in taste and what it does to the demand curve. Expectations for the future. 
Sometimes this will also shift the demand curve. If, oh, oh this is a good one because this is so true. This is very true right now. There's an expectation that we will consume more energy during the winter time because we expect the winter weather to be very brutal this year in 2022. We had a very hot summer. What that means is we're going to have a very cold winter. Okay. So the expectation is we'll consume more energy in the near future. This will cause a couple of things. It'll cause prices to increase for energy because we expect that we will consume more energy in the future. Therefore, the prices of energy will go up. That's probably what will happen. I don't want it to, but it will. So we expect an increase. Uh, other ones, yeah. If people expect their increases to go up, if their income to go up, then we would expect that their meals will be more expensive at restaurants. <laughs> so true. Um, and part of that has to do with inflation as well. So as in a way for people to combat inflation, we get more income. We get more income, we spend more. It's, yeah, it's just simple economics, right? Uh, and so... The restaurant owners know this. Okay, so they're going to raise the prices. Yeah, very normal. Future expectations. So just to kind of summarize all the different variables that cause shifts in demand, this is a nice slide. Uh, income, prices of related goods, also known as complementary or supplementary. Uh, pace, expectations, number of buyers, all these will cause shifts in the demand curve accordingly. Remember, when, it, when there's an increase in demand, the demand curve will shift to the right. If there's a decrease in demand, it will shift to the left. iPods, I don't even think they make those anymore, do they? They're just phones now, I think. Okay. Uh, the main curve for music downloads. Oh, this one's funny. Okay, what happens when there's uh, uh, to each of the following scenarios and why? The price of iPods falls. Well, there. So, uh, for those of you on the call, answer answer this question for me. If the price of iPods falls, will there be an increase or a decrease in music downloads? question right if the price of ipods falls will there be an increase or decrease in music downloads what do you think you saw an increase in the comments i say increase increase okay yeah good the faster it's you think increase as well chiquita yeah okay i agree with you i agree with you yes there would be an increase so the price of the component we use to download the music, if it goes down, yeah, there's going to be more music downloads, absolutely. Yeah, great, very well done. Next question. The price of music downloads decreases. Will there be more music downloads or less? If the price of the downloads goes down, will there be more or less? I think and there will be more, correct? There'll be more. Yeah, there'll be more. More. Exactly. The price goes yes. down. I'm going to want more. Yeah, you guys are 100% right. You, you all got it right. Most definitely. Yes, that's correct. The demand for music downloads will go up if the price for music downloads goes down. Oh. <laughs> Okay, this one, this last one, uh, you know, I don't know if it's as relevant today as it was a few years ago, uh, as it was even five years ago, right? If the price of music CDs, okay, for those of you who don't know what a CD is, and there might be a few of you, I hope you all know what a CD is, don't you? 
Oh, please tell me yeah. what CD is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know what CD is. I know. CD I know because yes. I know because yes. that's yes. uh, eight track. Yeah. Right. That, yeah. I don't have any near me, otherwise I'd show you what it looks like. But it's a disc, okay? <laughs> it's a it's a round disc and it's shiny. And you put it into a CD player of okay, CD player, DVD player, your car thingy player. There's a little slot you put it in there, and it plays music. I know, amazing. Okay, if the price of the music CD goes down, will the demand for music downloads go up or down? What do we think? I'll say it again. If the price of music CDs goes down, will the demand for music downloads go up or down? Uh because you can download your own music. Yeah, and no one uses the CDs anymore, Professor. So. <laughs> right, for real, exactly. So it wouldn't have a like and a major effect anyway, in my opinion. I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, technically, technically, yes, you guys would be correct in that case. Uh, back in 2018, when this slide was made. Um, the answer would be probably the demand would decrease for music downloads because the price of CDs went down. I would buy more CDs instead of downloading more music. In technical technical terms. Wait, wait, repeat that again. So if the price of music CDs goes down, technically people will buy more CDs and they'll download less music. That's what would what would what should happen in that case. But because technology has advanced, that's probably not the case anymore. <laughs> it's a good question. It's, you know, it's very theoretical. Very funny. Okay, so yeah. Uh, in most cases, when there's decreases in the device or there's decreases in the uh, price to download the music, yeah, of course, the demand curve is going to shift to the right. Um, because the price of entry, buying the unit, is less. That means I'm going to download more music. As the price of mu music downloads goes down, I'm going to download more music. So, yeah, it'll cause a shift in the demand curve to the right, 100%. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, and, and this, this also represents that change, right? Uh, the demand curve might not necessarily shift if the price goes down, because, but it will shift along the demand curve. Because remember, what causes a shift in the demand curve, it's things like more people buying the stuff. Yeah? More buyers. But if it's just a price change... I mean, sure, probably, you'll probably get more downloads, but not necessarily more people. So, therefore, uh, the demand will be higher, yes, but the price will be lower. Uh, yeah. If the Okay, the music CD thing. If the music CD thing were true, okay, just think, we'll just pretend we're like 10 years ago, yeah? So 10 years ago, uh, price of CDs comes down. I'm going to buy more CDs. Yeah, uh, I'll download less, so I'll, I'll, I'll buy more CDs, we think. <laughs> Just try to imagine. Okay, that's demand. Any questions on demand? Now we're jumping to supply. Good with demand? All right. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. No question. All right, cool. Right on. Let's rock and roll with some supply. Okay, supply. This is the quantity, supply. Yeah, quantity. It's the amount of the goods or the services available for sale, okay, that sellers are willing and able to sell. So it's the amount of goods or services available for sale that sellers are willing and able to sell. That's 
quantity supplied. The law of supply is very straightforward. When the price of goods goes up, okay, the quantity of supply of the good also rises. When the price of goods goes up, the quantity also goes up. Here's why. When we rise our prices, it's usually because there's not enough on the marketplace. That's what causes rises in price. There's not enough in the marketplace to, to meet the demand where it is. Okay. In order to meet the demand where it is, we need to supply more. Okay. Example, gasoline. Okay. Demand for gasoline, very high. Okay. Therefore, the price per gallon of gasoline, very high. In order to reduce price of gasoline, I need to make more gasoline to meet demand where it is. That's why. That's according to the law of supply. Prices are high. I need to get more on the marketplace to meet demand where it is in order to get the price stabilized. That's law of supply. When prices fall, I'm going to make less. Okay, gasoline again. Here we go. Uh, usually, usually, these days I don't even know what usual is. Usually, when the price of gasoline comes down, it's because less people are using it. If less people are using it, I'm going to make less of it. Why the hell would I keep making gasoline? If less people are using my gasoline, I'm not. Simple. So that's the law of supply. Chiquita, you good? Or is that pretending? Yes, I'm fine. No, no, I meant to put the thumbs up. I was agreeing, Professor. I'm sorry. Um, and it's all the same these days. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. <laughs> but that's the law of supply. Yeah. And that's, that, again, Prices are really set by supply and demand. People don't think that they are. They really are. I promise you they are. There's no there's no one behind the curtain. There's there's no there's there's no one behind the curtain pulling strings of, on prices. That's a load of BS. Okay. That's like saying the president has can dictate gas prices. That's laughable. The president can't tell a gas company to make more gas. President can't tell gas companies to lower the prices. No. It's set by supply and demand. Okay, we'd be living in some communist country if that were the case. Starbucks. Oh, I love Starbucks. Okay, let's talk about our lattes. Starbucks got good lattes, don't they? Okay, so take a look at Starbucks. Supply. Let's talk about the supply side of Starbucks. Now, the thing is, uh, I'm going to supply more at higher prices. Starbucks got to make money. <laughs> okay? Starbucks got to make money. So, when the prices are real low, Starbucks is going to make less lattes. Okay? Also, because less, if less people want them, I'm not going to keep making them. You understand? The price is low. I'm not going to keep making it at that low price. No freaking way. Okay? That's why I'm, I'm not making... Just because Sam and Dean want 16 lattes at $0, I'm not going to give it to them at $0 because I'm not going to make it for $0. It's just crazy. Nobody makes something for zero dollars. At a price of one dollar, I'm charged one dollar for a latte. I'll make three of them. Okay. At two dollars, I can make six lattes for for two dollars. All right. For three dollars, I'll make nine lattes. Four dollars, I'll make twelve. Five dollars, I'll make fifteen. Six dollars, I'll make eighteen. The higher the price, the higher the quantity. 
Again, we have to meet the man where it is. So in order to meet the man when it's high at higher prices, I need to make more of them. That's the concept behind supply. You know, at very high prices, even with gasoline, at high prices, the gasoline companies are going to make more gasoline. Okay, because they have to meet supply or demand where it is. That's the reason. Okay. When demand is low, we're not going to make that many. When demand is high, we're going to make a lot. When demand is high, the price is high. That means the quantity will also be high to meet demand. Everyone understands this concept so far? Quantity? Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. I can graph it out. Now, supply is the opposite of demand, obviously. Supply is the amount of the goods or services available for sale that the sellers are willing to sell. Okay. And so the supply curve is upward sloping and to the right. Upward sloping to the right. It's always upward sloping and to the right. The supply curve is always upward sloping and to the right. Okay. Now we see I've I've got my chart for lattes. Zero at zero, one at three, two at six, three dollars, I'll make nine of them, four dollars I'll make twelve, five I'll make fifteen, six I'll make eighteen, so forth and so on. This is the supply curve for what? Starbucks. And just as it so happens to work with demand, we have market supply. Market supply is the sum of all of the supplies for all the sellers of a particular good or a service. There's a market for lattes, okay? And the market for lattes is all of the lattes that Starbucks is selling, all of the lattes that Gregory is selling, all of the lattes that Illy is selling, all of the latte, I'm thinking of like DC uh, coffee shops, all of the lattes that whoever else makes lattes are selling, that's the market supply. It's the sum of all the lattes available, the market for lattes. And uh, as you would think, the supply curve represents the sum of all those lattes. To find the total quantity supplied at any price, we simply add up all of the individual quantities. I'll add up however many lattes Starbucks is selling, plus all the lattes that Dunkin' Donuts is selling, plus all the lattes that Gregory is selling, plus all the lattes, you see where I'm going with this. Those equal the market supply. Phone's blowing up. Okay, Pete's Coffee. Oh, I always, I always forget about Pete's. Pete's Coffee, for those of you who don't know who they are, uh, they're a big coffee chain out on the West Coast. Uh, they started in the Seattle area, just like Starbucks did. Um, they have uh, a decent following. And in fact, I think Starbucks bought a certain amount of Pete's Coffee's shares. I think they might be majority owners now, but they, uh, I'm sorry, I digress. Um, okay, so let's say we have Starbucks and Pete's coffee shops. They're the only two sellers of lattes on the market. We know that's not true, but just pretend that they are. We take all of the quantity that Starbucks is supplying, plus all of the quantity that Pete's coffee shop is supplying for lattes. We add them together to get the market quantity supplied. That's what QS stands for, quantity supply. And so we can see, yes, we add up all of the players on the market that are selling lattes to get the market quantity supply. Very similar to the way we did it with demand. So I add up all my players. I got my quantity supply. And so I can plot my quantity supply curve. 
just as you might expect, there are shifts that could happen with the quantity supplied. And these shifts are based on determinants in the marketplace. If there's less sellers on the marketplace, it'll cause a shift in the supply curve. If there's more sellers of the product on the marketplace, it'll cause a shift in the supply curve. <laughs> right? So the number of sellers is a determinant factor in the, in the supply curve. Uh, other things like in, input prices. If Starbucks has an increase in wages and raw materials, like, you know, cost of the paper cups and the lids and the stir sticks and the sugar packets and all that junk, and then you got your employees, they want more money. So your input prices, input costs, this should, be, this should say cost, really. If the cost of labor and materials increases, this will have a negative impact, okay, on the supply. I can't make as much if I have so many costs. I'll have to increase my prices. That's why you see in the news a lot, uh, oh, the cost of labor is going up, so it's causing the prices of a lot of things to go up. Yeah, that's true. It's true. If you go you go to any restaurant, that's the case. Okay. Uh, you know, they'll say, oh, my materials went up. You know, my food prices went up. My wages went up. So I have to raise the prices. And that's, that's normal. That's how you stay in business. So uh, this will cause a shift in the, the, the supply curve to the right when stuff like this happens. So it causes a shift in the supply curve to the right. My costs go up. I have to be able to supply more to cover those additional costs. Uh, price of milk goes down. My quantity is going to go up. Price of milk goes up. Quantity is going to go down. So forth and so on. You get it. Other things that cause shifts in the supply curve, technology. Technology gets a lot better. I'll be able to supply a lot more. I got robots packing all my boxes. Now I can supply a lot more. Shift in the demand curve to the right. Also saves me money on labor. Yeah. Number of sellers. We have an increase in the number of competition. I got more coffee shops opening up. They'll cause a shift in the supply curve to the right. The opposite's, of course, true. You know, if there's less supply, it goes to less. Works the same way. Uh, and future expectations, of course, is going to cause shifts in the supply curve. Uh, if there's a war in the Middle East, it'll cause the prices of uh, oil to increase, which will cause a shift in the supply curve to the left, because I can't get as much oil on the marketplace. So forth and so on. So just to summarize, things that shift supply curve, changes in uh, cost of raw materials and wages, changes in technology, future expectations, and of course, the number of sellers on the marketplace. Uh, we won't go through this exercise, but I just wanted to kind of show you what this looks like. This is for tax preparation software. I personally like TurboTax. I don't know why. It's just easy to use. You don't want this too long. Ethan, you good? Why would you? I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> I think you just accidentally went off mute. No worries. Uh, I'm just playing. Um, okay, so, so I like to use... Uh, uh, TurboTax, yeah. Some of you have your own preference for tax software. Some of you might go to someone to get them done, or you might do them yourself using paper and pen. I don't know why you would do that, but that's okay. Uh, so we can draw supply curves, right, for tax, things like tax software. 
retailers cut the price of the software. Okay, so um, the price goes down. That usually also means that the supply is going to go down. Okay, uh, technology advances. Uh, the software can be produced at a lower cost. We'll probably produce more. Yeah, so supply will go up. Professional tax return preparers raise the price of the services they provide. We're going to increase our software supply because so we've got to compete against those tax preparers. <laughs> you know, uh, but it, it just shows you, you know, very interestingly the shifts, the shifts in the uh, in the demand curve. Okay, now, the moment you've all been waiting for, where supply and demand meet, okay? We talked about demand. That's the amount of the goods and the services that the people demand, the, pe the, the amount that they need, that they're willing to buy, okay? And supply, the, the sellers are supplying the amount of the products that the people need and that they want to buy, okay? Yeah. We, you get my story. So supply and demand, they're on the same graph. They're usually always on the same graph together. Demand is always downward sloping to the right. Supply is always upward sloping into the right. Okay. The two intersect at one point. At, right, you see it right there. Oh, $3 uh, per latte. And I can sell 15 of them at that price. That point where they intersect, it's called equilibrium. Equilibrium, where the two intersect. Supply and demand, where they meet, we call that equilibrium. Equilibrium. It's where the two equal. Equilibrium. It's where supply equals demand. Equilibrium. That's what this intersection point means here. Equilibrium. It's where the supply equals demand. Equilibrium. So $3 uh, per latte, 15 lattes. That's my point of equilibrium. Now, looking at it graphically, I know that my point of equilibrium is $3, and 15 is my quantity. And if I look at my chart on the right, it's where quantity equals demand. Quantity demand equals quantity supplied. QD equals QS. Quantity demand equals quantity supplied. That is the point of equilibrium. It's where quantity demand equals quantity supplied. Point of equilibrium. Three dollars. Fifteen lattes. Quantity demand equals quantity supplied. It is equilibrium. Uh, I don't want to ask the experts about price caption. Let's keep going. Okay. Now, looking at this, we know we know that supply can go above demand. We know that demand can go above supply. We know that the supply can go below demand. And we also know that demand could go below supply. It's all possible, right? I could be anywhere on this demand curve. My my dot could be anywhere on this demand curve. Okay, it could be above, below, right at equilibrium. It could be anywhere. So there's a couple of terms that we use when it's not in equilibrium. One of those terms is called a surplus. A surplus is when we have more supply available than what is demanded. When I got more stuff on the market than what people want, that's called a surplus. That's why stores like um, Costco exist. That's why stores like Surplus Freight exist. These are stores where there's a lot of extra stuff available. Demand's not as high, so they buy it, they have it in bulk. So surplus. 
An example of that, uh, the price per latte is $5. So, yeah, I'm going to make a lot of them because, you know, that's a good price for the supplier. Not, I can make nine, I can, uh, I can sell nine lattes at $5 a piece. Which means I'm going to supply 25 lattes. That's a surplus of lattes. That's a lot of lattes available. This results in a surplus of 16 lattes. The surplus formula, very simple. We take the quantity supplied minus the quantity demanded equals the surplus amount. The quantity supplied minus the quantity demanded equals the surplus amount. In this example, 16 lattes is the surplus. The demand is 9. I'm, I've provided 25 lattes. I have a surplus of 16 lattes. Now, when we have a surplus, we do the only smart thing to do, reduce the price to sell off the surplus, <laughs> okay? Because we got to get close to equilibrium. That's the whole idea. So I'm going to reduce the price. I got 25 lattes. Uh, my surplus is 16. I got to get that surplus down. Reduce the price. I reduce the price. It causes my demand to increase and my supply to decrease ever so slightly, which reduces our surplus. Sounds logical to me. That's why when you go to places like Costco or to Sam's Club or to, uh, you know, any of those warehouse stores, you see a lot of stuff on the shelves. And they usually put it on sale when it doesn't sell well. To get rid of the surplus. Prices will eventually continue to fall until we reach the point of equilibrium. That's all, equilibrium is like the goal. That's what we're aiming for. Sometimes there's a shortage also. When we're not in equilibrium, we might have a shortage. Instead of a surplus, we got a shortage. Oh my goodness. The demand is so great for lattes, I simply can't make enough lattes, okay? If I'm selling a latte for $1, and my demand for lattes is at 21, there's no way I can make 21 lattes in a dollar. I can only make five, okay? That was just not enough money for me to make that many lattes. So I can make five lattes at a dollar. That creates a shortage of lattes. Not enough lattes to go around. Okay. So this is called a shortage. It's when the demand is greater than the supply. It causes a shortage. And we can, of course, calculate that shortage. You know, we have a shortage. I made five lattes. The demand is 21. So 21 minus 5. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16. 16 lattes I'm short by to meet the demand. So what do we do to decrease demand? We raise the price. We raise the price. Demand goes down. And as I raise the price, my supply goes up. Remember, supply goes up with the price. Yeah. We do this in order to meet demand where it is. Remember. So it causes demand to fall. It causes supply to rise, which reduces the shortage of lattes. Now, I'm only short by 10 lattes. Okay, I raise the price still. And eventually, I'm going to need to raise the price to $3 in order to reduce the demand to meet supply. 
at the point of equilibrium. Equilibrium is the goal in supply and demand. So we look at supply and demand together to understand the point of equilibrium, where it is. Okay. We also decide whether the events shift the supply curve, demand curve, or in some cases, both. Man, that's, that's always a fun one, right? Um, and I think we're, seeing, we're kind of seeing that in today's um, environment with inflation as we're seeing the shift of both supply and demand uh, in, some, in some markets. We need to make a decision whether the, the, uh, the curve shifts to the left or the right. And of course, it's based off of the market factors. And we use the supply and demand uh, diagram to understand and compare where the new equilibrium is uh, based off of those shifts. So when there's shifts in the demand curves and the supply curves, it will create a new point of equilibrium. It'll create a new point of equilibrium when there's shifts in the demand curve. When there are shifts in the supply curve, it will still create a new point of equilibrium in most cases. <laughs> Uh, when there's a change in the quantity supplied, it'll move along the fixed uh, supply curve and occurs when the price changes. When there's a change in demand, it'll cause a shift in the demand curve. Not necessarily when the price changes. When there's a change in the quantity demanded, it'll cause a shift in the demand curve. And there will be a change in the price, of course. Technology reduces the cost of producing a new car. So the supply will increase. The quantity will increase and the price will come down. And the demand will go up. Sometimes there's a shift in both curves. Supply and demand go up, so there's going to be a new point of equilibrium. Price goes up a little bit, quantity goes up a lot of it. And we see this, you know, and a lot of this has to do with changes in market factors and things like that. Nothing too crazy though. It's just a matter of understanding the differences. Um, okay. Eh, we're not, not going to go through the exercise again. Very similar to that music CD thing that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Okay. We will talk about this one. Markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. When you group like things together, it's a way of organizing it, right? We do the same things with markets. There's a market for lattes. There's a market for oranges. There's a market for apples. There's a market for gasoline. There's a market for housing. There's a market for clothing. There's a market for water, etc. In market economies, like we have here in the United States, prices adjust to balance supply and demand. That's what's happening right now. You know, the, the supply and demand forces are combating uh, inflation. That's why we see these shifts in the markets. The point, the equilibrium prices are changing. Okay, the signals that a guide of economic decisions are uh, used to allocate scarce resources. And that's why, you know, we, we see that housing market go crazy, the prices go crazy, but housing becomes a scarce resource, right? When, when, and it causes shifts in the equilibrium. 
So to summarize what we talked about today in a relatively easy way, demand and supply are the fundamentals of economics, okay? This is what dictates prices, supply and demand. When there's changes in supply and demand, the price is going to change. Uh, the law of demand is when the price of a good falls, the quantity of the demand rises. Price goes down, demand goes up. Price goes down, demand goes up. Price goes up, demand goes down. That's the fundamentals of the law of demand. Obviously, there's other things that affect it. With supply, price goes up, supply goes up. Supply goes down. The prices go down. Okay, that's the law of supply. They are they follow price. Supply follows price. Of course, there's some factors that influence that as well. But it's also important to understand that the point of equilibrium, which is where the quantity supplied equals the quantity demanded. That is the point of equilibrium. That's where the two intersect. And we constantly work toward the point of equilibrium. That's why we see changes in price. That's why we see changes in quantity. That's why we see changes in demand. It's to meet equilibrium. That's the goal. If the, uh, there's a shortage, that means that we don't have enough supply to meet demand. If there's a surplus, that means we have too much quantity when demand is lower. That's the concept of the idea. It's also important to understand why shifts in demand and supply happen. You know, it's important to make these types of comparisons and really to understand these types of concepts. And if you need help understanding any of these other concepts, just let me know, okay? Uh, but supply and demand, this chapter, this topic, probably the most important thing you'll ever learn at the university. And the reason why I say that is because it impacts you every single day. Whether you know it or not, it has a dramatic impact on your life. Everything surrounds supply and demand and economics, and economics impacts you daily. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Y'all good? I didn't bore you to death, right? I kept you entertained, hopefully. Okay, all right. I appreciate all that I do. My goal is to keep you entertained and keep you happy and keep and keep you full of knowledge. Okay, just to remind you of what's going on in the classroom again. Module one, week three. You guys owe me a discussion board. Uh, Sunday night, I need you to full paragraphs, okay? Don't BS me. No two, three sentences. That ain't going to fly. Full paragraph responses to my questions. My questions are really straightforward. Okay. 2021, during the pandemic, the market for used cars experienced a dramatic shift in supply in the uh, shift in the supply demanded. And the supply shift in supply and demand, I should say. The shift was brought on because of a global shortage of computer chips for automobiles. Describe the effects of supply and demand, price, and other factors of this event or other ones that you've seen during the pandemic. Use examples, do some research online, uh, and add to the discussion. It's fun. I promise this is a fun discussion. I'm looking for full paragraphs. It's about 150 words or so, four to six sentences. Use citations and references where applicable and respond to two of your classmates with full paragraphs, four to six sentences, okay? Clear? That's what I'm looking for. Y'all good, still awake, <laughs> okay? 
Yes, clear. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much. Okay, y'all. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. If you need anything, you can email me, call me, set up office hours. Uh, email is always best. Yeah, it's just the quickest way. Uh, other than that, I look forward to reading your discussion post uh, this Sunday. I'm really looking forward to that. I think it's going to be a good discussion. And uh, with that, please remember to stay safe, wash your hands, do the right things. I'll see you all again uh, same time. Uh, well, I'll see you next week. Thank you all so much for your time today. Appreciate all of you. Take care.